Hi class, welcome to the second half of lecture for today. Uh, so we've been talking about uh, the Drake equation, going back to it after our very early encounter with it this quarter. Uh, what we're trying to do is get to what its original intent was, which is to calculate uh, the number of active civilizations in the Milky Way galaxy that we might be able to uh, receive a message from or send a message to. Okay, so that was his original intent. Uh, it was invented by Frank Drake uh, at a conference at the National Radio Astronomy Observatory uh, in Green Bank. So behind me here today is a picture of the Green Bank Telescope. This is the largest steerable radio telescope in the world. It's 300 meters across from one edge to the other, so it's quite enormous. Uh, if you go visit uh, Green Bank in West Virginia, and you happen to be able to get onto a tour, uh, sometimes they take people out to this telescope, and I've had the good fortune of going out with them. Uh, so when I was there, they took us, uh, you, you go up to these kind of gangways on the infrastructure that run around the middle here, and then there's an elevator that takes you all the way up to the feed. So I've been up to the feed horn room right here in that little room there that I'm pointing at. And so looking down on that, imagine, you know, it's kind of like being at Ryan Field here at Northwestern and looking out over the entire football field. That's how large this telescope is. The whole telescope tips back and forth and then it rotates. You can see the tracks there at the bottom that it rotates around uh, and they can point it anywhere in the sky that they want to. So many SETI searches have been done on this telescope in addition to other science that they've done, looking at black holes and radio galaxies and quasars and all sorts of stuff, but there have been SETI searches done on this telescope as well. Uh, and of course, the uh, Green Bank Observatory is where all of this began uh, with Project Ozma. So the telescope that Frank did Project Ozma on uh, is just kind of up the road here from the GBT, and you can still see it if you go to uh, Green Bank uh, for a visit. So. Okay, so let me go ahead and start some slides. So today we're going to talk about the lifetime of civilizations. Uh, so that's the last element in the Drake equation uh, that we uh, want to talk about. And one of the things that we'll do to talk about the lifetime of civilizations is we'll look at some examples here on Earth. Uh, so the cover slide here, this is uh, at Mesa Verde in Colorado. So this is the remains of one of the ancient Puebloan uh, civilizations uh, sites uh, there in Colorado. There's kind of several throughout the area there. Uh, there's a big one at Taos, there's a big one at Chaco Canyon, there's this one at Mesa Verde, uh, but these are the ancestors of the Puebloans that uh, live in the area still today. Uh, this civilization, like many civilizations in the ancient world, uh, collapsed. Uh, and in particular, like many civilizations around this time in uh, uh, North and South America, it appears to have collapsed due to um, an extended drought, so climatic issues. So the Mississippians uh, culture, which uh, extends through the Mississippi Valley, uh, they, that collapsed around the same time as the ancient Puebloans here. Uh, the civilization in Bolivia around what is Lake Titicaca, that civilization collapsed at the same time. So climate shifting uh, was certainly one of the issues that causes uh, civilizations to decline in the historical record in the ancient world. And we'll come back and talk about that um, again. Okay, so what we want to do today is we'll start with what is the problem with L? What, why is L so hard compared to all of the other numbers in the Drake equation? We'll talk about some possible values of L. We'll use ancient civilizations. We'll use some other speculations uh, to help us try and guess what the value of L might be. And then at the end, we'll take all the numbers that we've been talking about and we'll drop them back into that spreadsheet of the Drake, uh, Drake equation that we showed at the end of the first half of lecture and talk about what it's telling us um, about the Milky Way galaxy. Okay, so here's the Drake equation. It's the familiar slide we've been looking at all quarter. Uh, at this point, we've talked about all the first six numbers, and this half of the lecture, I just want to focus on L, which is the lifetime of a species, or in this case, the lifetime of a civilization uh, in years overall. Okay, so why is L hard to estimate? Of all the numbers in the Drake equation, it's the only one that doesn't depend on the laws of nature. It depends on random chance in the universe, both on natural factors as well as sociological factors. 
factors, okay? And so what do we mean by that? So an example of a natural factor is the fact that there have been major extinction events on the planet which occur on the planet due to outside influences. And on Earth, there have been five major extinction events to date. Okay, we're in the middle of a sixth one, as we discussed earlier in the quarter. The majority of those extinction events we think come from outside causes. Uh, we don't know necessarily what triggered them all, but at the KT boundary, where the uh, below the boundary we see dinosaurs and above the boundary we don't, that was caused by an asteroid impact. And so there are definitely opportunities for asteroids to completely wipe uh, species and indeed civilizations off the, the face of the planet. Uh, sociological reasons can be many. We've talked about some of those. Uh, right now, the most uh, prominent one in most of our minds is uh, climate change. So our civilization is uh, egregiously changing the atmospheric composition of the Earth. That has enormous impact on the future climate of the Earth, which affects not only us, but the entire ecosystem of the planet. Um, when I was growing up, the Cold War was still a big issue. Uh, that still is an issue today. The nuclear weapons are still there. So that's another example of a sociological factor, a civilization basically terminating itself and maybe terminating the entire biosphere at the same time same point. And then lastly, there's kind of something in between. So these ancient civilizations that uh, uh, we mentioned at the beginning when we were talking about Mesa Verde, uh, they may be uh, sociologically adept at keeping their civilization going. They may have learned agriculture, they may have learned how to uh, farm or move water or whatnot, but there may be mitigating um, uh, external factors like extended droughts or something that their, their technology may not be successful enough to overcome, okay? Uh, so here in the middle, we'll come back to this civilization. This is uh, examples of the ruins. This is Mohenjo Daro, uh, which is in current day Pakistan. Uh, this is one of the sites of the so-called Indus Valley civilization, uh, which was one of the earliest uh, uh, civilizations in the, uh, in the anthropological record. Okay, so this is why it's hard. And so let's talk about all the different possible ways, all the different possible values of L that we could imagine. And we can imagine very large values of L, and we can imagine very small values of L. And the consequence of that is that L ends up being probably the single most important factor in determining what the overall outcome of the Drake equation is. Okay, so let's, let's talk about the, the long factors. So the longest choice of L you can imagine making is based on the timeline of extinctions on a world. Now, if we take Earth as an example, and we assume that uh, similar extinction events could happen on any world around any star in the solar system, then the way we calculated that, and we did this early in the quarter, you will see, is we took the age of the Earth, we divided it by the number of extinctions that the planet has seen, and that gave us something like 900 million years for the maximum life that a civilization could extend, okay? Now, if I look at the dinosaurs, that's about right. The dinosaurs lived 170 million years before the KT extinction event uh, uh, erased them. Now, you could look at this and you could say, well, sure, but if your civilization is smart, maybe they would be able to survive an extinction event. And that's true, maybe it could. But right now, um, we don't know if that's possible, right? If, if an asteroid was coming to wipe us uh, off the, off the uh, fossil record, we don't know if we have the technology, technology to save ourselves from any possible asteroid event that might destroy our civilization, okay? Bruce Willis being alive and on the stand. Okay, so, so you could make all kinds of arguments and, and given the uncertainties in the Drake equation, if you think 100 million years is too short a time, then you just change the value in the Drake equation and you see what, other, what that does to the estimate of the number of civilizations in the galaxy, okay? Okay, but by and large, this is about the largest number any of us can imagine putting in the Drake equation based on the observational data we have here on Earth, okay? Now, another choice on the other extreme for L is a very pessimistic choice, which is to say that the appropriate choice for L based on currently what we know is that the maximum lifetime of a technological civilization, of a civilization that could talk, 
is the atomic or industrialization timeline. So basically, how long does a civilization live from the time it develops technology for the first time to the point where it becomes capable of destroying itself? Okay, so in the, in the timeline of industrialization, that's a couple of centuries. We've gone from, uh, from kind of existing uh, from uh, simple tools and simple machines, uh, burning wood and simple fossil fuels, to harnessing fossil fuels in a very ready way, building really complex machines, technology advancing very rapidly. We're changing the climate. That's one way we could destroy ourselves. We develop nuclear weapons very rapidly. That's another way we could destroy ourselves. But all of those things have happened because of industrialization and the uh, exponential progress in technological development. So if you're a pessimist, you could say that a species develops the ability to use technology far more rapidly than they develop the smarts to use that technology wisely. Okay, and much apocalyptic fiction is all about this point. We mess around in a bioweapons lab and we expose the world to some devastating zombie plague. We develop atomic weapons and we promptly destroy ourselves because we can't read uh, radars correctly or who knows what, right? There's all kinds of ways we've imagined the civilizations might end themselves. And so if you're prone to pessimism, then you might imagine that once a civilization becomes industrial, there's no way it's going to survive very long at all. So people on this front assume that uh, based on our current time that we've been alive uh, and assuming our civilization doesn't last much longer, then maybe L should really be about 100 years, okay? Now, um, I will say that I think that's too pessimistic, but I'm an optimist, so your mileage may vary, right? Oh, and this picture here, uh, this is a famous picture of our inability to use technology correctly. Uh, this is the uh, Mont Mont Montparse uh, station in Paris. Uh, this is a train uh, that came into the station too fast. It blasted through the end of the bumper and uh, knocked its way through a wall. So this is, uh, this is an example of our inability to use technology once we develop it. So. Okay, so uh, the other choice of L we could use based on the observational data. If we look at the anthropological record, uh, there are many civilizations, particularly uh, in the era before industrialization and uh, colonization, uh, uh, the colonial era, uh, there were many long-lived civilizations all around the world in in China, in India, in Africa, uh, in uh, 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 South America, and Latin America, there, there have been civilizations that lived there for hundreds, if not thousands of years. So uh, this again here, this is a different site. This is the Indus Valley Civilization. Uh, this is Dolavira, uh, which is in present-day India, near the, bo near the border with Pakistan. Uh, this is an enormous city. This is one of the largest Indus Valley sites that we know of. Um, the Indus Valley Civilization was noted for many reasons. So they are one of the oldest civilizations in the record. Uh, they were very well known for their urban planning. They have very sophisticated cities with drainage systems and reservoirs for distributing water to the citizens. Uh, they had metallurgy, so this is uh, during the Bronze Age. Uh, so, so this civilization was kind of just a really uh, early civilization that was able to harness technology and allow the population, the civilization to grow dramatically. So there were uh, order millions of citizens in the Indus Valley civilization at its height. Now, the Indus Valley civilization, like the Puebloans that we talked about and the Mississippians and, and, and uh, others in the Americas, this civilization collapsed after several thousand years. Uh, it was, uh, we think, largely due to, uh, again, the shifting climate. So when you have concentrated urban areas, if your climate shifts, then the agricultural support for the population uh, can't be supported. And so the civilization has to abort, uh, abandon uh, the, the cities that they built. So, uh, so this is a this is what they think happened uh, to Indus Valley. But again, it was kind of thousand-ish years rather than that pessimistic hundred-ish years. So, if you want to use this as observational data, then a number you might take for the lifetime of a civilization might be something like five thousand years. Okay, that's still a tiny number. 
And if you talk to anthropologists or you talk to SETI specialists, they may like that number to be larger. They may think it should be 20,000 or 10,000 or something. But again, this is the power of the Drake equation. We don't know what these numbers should be. And so we can choose any number. We could say we want this number to be 20,000 because, fill in your reason, and then go, go calculate what the implications are for the number of civilizations in the galaxy, okay? So let's go back to our Drake table. So here are all the numbers in the first six columns that we had from, <coughs> pardon me, from the first half of lecture. And then I put over here in the uh, right-hand column the values for L that you and I just talked about, okay? And so I've taken 105,000, so that's the ultra-pessimistic value and then the kind of pessimistic value, and I've assigned them here to the two pessimistic uh, levels. I've taken 10,000 years to be the level for the optimistic row. So that's someone who said, oh, sure, you know, the Indus Valley civilization just had bad luck. Uh, they could have survived 10,000 years easily if there hadn't been a drought, right? That kind of argument. Uh, and then the bottom there, 100 million years, that's the, the dinosaur limit, the extinction limit, okay? So if I take those values and I calculate the number of civilizations in the Milky Way galaxy, this is what I get. Now, if you read down that column, pessimistic's at the top, most optimistic at the bottom, any number less than one functionally means Earth is the only communicable civilization in the galaxy at this time. So, in particular, I draw your attention to the green realm. That is the principle of mediocrity. The choices we made for a civil for uh, 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 for a uh, system of planets that easily develops life, that easily develops intelligence, that has lots of plants in the habitable zone, all of those things. The principle of mediocrity. The number still comes out to be 0.3, which means Earth is the only civilization in the galaxy with radio technology. Okay. Now, that's because the lifetime L is really short. If we survive all the threats against our civilization from within, our influence on the climate, our propensity for our ability to destroy ourselves through war and strife, our ability to fight off asteroids that might destroy us, all of those things, right? If we can survive as long as the dinosaurs survive, and that ability is common among civilizations, then we're actually in the bottom row. And in the bottom row, the number is very large, 60,000. Now, you may not like some of the values in the bottom row, and so you may go back to the principal mediocrity row and go, yeah, but look, these numbers right here for the fraction of plants that develop intelligence and the fraction of plants that develop communication, we, didn't, we weren't as optimistic as we could have been right there. You still were really conservative when you chose those values. And you're right. I was still really conservative when I chose those values because I didn't want to overestimate the number of civilizations there might be in the galaxy. So what's the power of the Drake equation? The power of the Drake equation is for you to say, Larson, I think you were too pessimistic. I'd really like to change those values. And I'm like, great, change those values in your spreadsheet and let's see how it changes our, uh, our impl uh, the implications for our searches for extraterrestrial life in the galaxy, okay? So if you change those both to point one, one in 10 planets develop intelligent life, and of those, one in 10 planets develop radio telescopes, then it changes from less than one to 30. There could, at this very moment, be 30 alien civilizations strewn across the Milky Way galaxy that maybe we could communicate with. Now, that's a bigger number than just us. There's 30 different civilizations we could talk to. That's still not very many, given the total number of stars in the Milky Way. The total number of stars in the Milky Way is 400 billion. We're talking about 30 out of 400 billion. 
So a couple weeks ago, maybe last week, we talked about uh, this Peter Mulvey song that I like called Vlad the Astrophysicist. So for those of you who went and listened to Vlad the Astrophysicist, this is Vlad's point. The number of civilizations is so small that by the time they could communicate with them, they're probably gone. Psst. 30 is a tiny, tiny number. And so again, the only way there are going to be lots and lots of civilizations is if the scenario at the bottom there is really the right one. And the scenario at the bottom there is really only the right one if the lifetime L is large. The entire implication for the Drake equation, all of these numbers, we can butts around with them all we want, but the number that has the biggest influence is how long the civilization lasts. How long can it protect itself and survive all the challenges that face it so that it transmits radio signals and can be communicable for a long, long time, okay? Now, this is just about intelligent life, right? This is just about places we could send signals to and talk to them or receive signals from, okay? But I'll remind you that we had used the Drake equation this way during the first couple weeks of class, and this is the case for just planets with any life at all. Planets where we'll find daisies and dinosaurs or alien daisies and alien dinosaurs, but life that complicated. The number could still be quite enormous, 5.5 billion. And if that number is large, then our guess is for what the number of intelligence uh, fraction is, what the communication fraction is, and indeed what the lifetime is, will have profound implications for whether or not there is intelligent life or not. But the, the, the fraction of planets, if you're an optimist, and many of you have asked over the quarter, am I in the optimistic camp or the rare camp? So we're at the end of the quarter now, so I'll confess I'm in the optimistic camp. Uh, the number of planets with life could be enormous, okay? Which means there's still the possibility that the number of planets with intelligent life could be this number here at the bottom, tens of thousands of planets, okay? Okay, so uh, that's all I'm gonna say for this part of the lecture. Um, as always, I like to leave you with things to read about. Uh, so the first thing up here at the top uh, this is a recent paper by Frank Drake, uh, recent, it's 2011, so it's about nine years old. Frank's 90 years old now, but uh, this, is, uh, uh, this is a paper he wrote where he reviewed all the current status of the search for extraterrestrial intelligence. So this was in 2011. We had already started to discover exoplanets, but I think it's really great to kind of read uh, what, uh, what Frank thinks about and what Frank's uh, still uh, pondering uh, during, during this time. So uh, this is a, a journal paper. If you type in that URL there, uh, it will take you to the uh, page for the journal. If you're logged in through the Northwestern VPN so that it thinks you're on campus, uh, it will let you download the PDF of that paper and you can read it, okay? Similarly, if you're logged on uh, with your Northwestern ID through the, uh, into the Northwestern Library, then these two books are both from Cambridge and you may enjoy reading them. Uh, the one's called The Drake Equation. It has a chapter about each of the number, actually it has two chapters about each of the numbers in the Drake Equation. It talks about what we thought before 1961 and what we've learned since. So it's kind of a nice historical as well as present thinking about the Drake Equation. Uh, and then this one is about what we talked about last period, uh, solving the Fermi paradox. It's about uh, many of the ideas that people have about what the resolution to the Fermi paradox really is. So if you log in, uh, if you go to Northwestern Libraries and go to the record uh, for these pages, and then you log in uh, with your net ID, uh, you can get the electronic version of both of these books and read them in PDF form, okay? So that's uh, what I'm gonna leave you with uh, for the day. That's all I'm gonna say for right now. So I hope you're all doing well. On Friday, it will be our last lecture. And so uh, what we'll do on Friday is we'll talk about doing something more than sitting here on our couch and listening to the universe through our radio telescopes. We're gonna talk about special relativity, and then we're gonna use that as a foundation to talk about what would it take to actually build a starship to go somewhere else in the galaxy, okay? So that'll be our last lecture for the class. Uh, I hope you're all doing well, and I'll talk to you again soon. Take care, everybody.